what better way to celebrate women's history than taking a look at one of the most misogynistic pastors out there, the one and only Dale Partridge. Dale is here to discuss his new book, The Manliness of Christ. Yep, you heard me correctly. Dale wants everyone to make sure to emphasize that Jesus had a penis. And if you don't have a penis, well, then you just aren't good enough to handle the Word of God because those words were written by people with penises. Let's have a chat. Hello and welcome. Thank you so much for joining me and especially to my patrons and channel members. Dale Partridge recently wrote the booklet, The Manliness of Christ. This is his interview with Kyle Thompson on the channel Undaunted Life, a channel that says it's for men only. So hide your vaginas and boobs, ladies. Let's take a peek. There's a massive biblical and theological illiteracy in the church. I agree with you there, Dale. I remember a conversation where someone said, the Lord helps those who help themselves. That's in the Bible. And when I pointed out that no, that isn't in the Bible, she was surprised and said that her mom had told her that it was, so she just assumed that it was in the Bible. But Dale, when people do read their whole Bibles, they tend to become atheists, or at least come to see that the Christian God can't live up to his own claims. So maybe the illiteracy is a good thing for your side. On the other hand, if your faith is dependent on followers not understanding it, then it isn't true. Uh, most people don't know what they believe. Uh, you know, I, a quote that I often say is that if you believe wrong, you'll never live strong. <laughs> right, because some believers aren't doing it right. They don't believe right because they don't believe the same things that I do. And a lot of the guys don't have the ability to actually engage because they're just actually stuck in, um, uh, in just, you know, a pew listening on and, you know, we're all surrounded by, you know, 400 people surrounded by one man. 400 people surrounded by one man. How does that work, Dale? That would have to be an awfully big man to surround 400 people. Did he eat them? Or is the one man the real man in the crowd? If so, you seem to put certain men on pedestals and claim them to be supermen. And so I started doing some history and some research looking about what was the most fruitful expression of the church throughout church history. There's really two eras that come to mind. It's the early church, the first couple hundred years, and then the Reformation era. And so those two eras I looked at and I was like, what, what's so special about these eras? Um, and they were gathering in homes or very small communities of faith. And they were out of a, a, a state of persecution. They were out of a, a position of defense. Their eschatology was more optimistic than pessimistic. Um, so there's a handful of things, but the house church thing really stuck to me. And I go, when you think of a house church, house church has a bad brand. I mean, most house churches I would call heresy factories. They're really not that great. They're glorified Bible studies, people that are elitist, people that have detached themselves from church history. Uh, they're nonconformists um, and, and they're not confessional Christianity. That, that's generally the trend about house church. But I thought, how do we create biblical, reformed, doctrinally sound house churches? That was a lot to really say not much at all. Dale doesn't like the megachurches like the Joel Osteens or the Ken Copelands. But also in this category of megachurches would be some of his own heroes, like John MacArthur, John Piper, and Tim Keller, the current giants of the Reformed theology, Dale's brand of theology. Yet even the kind of church that Dale thinks is the right way to do church, small house churches, most people are getting it wrong. It seems that Dale and Dale alone, or at least him and only a few others, know how to do church the right way. We started Reformation Seminary. We've had 70 men, uh, yeah, 75 men uh, go through that program now. Uh, graduated two classes now, it's a one-year program. Dale's seminary is interesting. Of course, no women are allowed. But also, men that want to come must have children, or at least have a child on the way. One also must attend in person. So why does Dale think it's good to take men away from their children for a year for his program? 
Guess family values get trumped by serving God the right way, which only Dale seems to know how to do. We are more than a quarter of the way through the video, and he hasn't even mentioned his book, the alleged topic of this video. Let's skip ahead a bit. Uh, you have a new thing that you're, you're going to be launching and I don't want to take any of the sting out of it. So I want you to tell our audience about it because guys, if you're listening to this on time. Goodness, even the YouTube video is supposed to be for men only. Ladies, we are peeking in when we are not welcome. Maybe we all need strap-ons so we can understand this better. Guys that are putting too many irons in the fire that are compromising their family, not cool, right? Uh, right. People ask me all the time, how do, you, how do you do this? How do you have so many things? John MacArthur, if you look at his life, he's got so many things going on. Mm -hmm. R.C. Sproul, we look at his life, so many things going on. S different schools and ministries and books and writing and conferences. And Newsflash, Dale. R.C. Sproul died in 2017. You made this video just eight months ago, and the book you're promoting came out a year ago. How did you not know that Sproul died five years before you made this claim that he is writing books and doing conferences? I think this gives us an idea of how well Dale fact checks. Here, we've been able to build a small team. We've been able to get a good support of donors that support the vision and the mission of what we're doing and guys that can help carry out these massive projects. It might be easier to carry out these massive projects if you don't exclude half the population that is well qualified to help you. But don't tell Dale that. His projects are garbage and don't deserve any support. The best problems to solve are urgent, required, and painful problems. Uh, if you're going to start a business or solve a problem or start a ministry, you need to figure out if you're solving an urgent, required, and painful problem. The reason toilet paper is so successful is because why? It solves an urgent, required, and painful problem, right? Uh, nobody wants to wipe their butt with their hand. So you want to be God's toilet paper. God can wipe his butt with you and your men. Great idea, Dale. How do we do this when we only when 90% of the Christians aren't engaged? And so I thought, I wanted to find out what was stopping them. And we found out that there was really three reasons stopping men and women from sharing the gospel. Number oh, so women are allowed to share the gospel. So why are they excluded from your seminary? Not that I would have any desire to go. But I'm also wondering why this video is only aimed at men if you are fine with women learning this and joining your work. Weird. Number one is they're afraid of rejection. Um, and to be honest, guys, the best of us are afraid of rejection. Okay, the Apostle Paul would sometimes struggle with these things. Um, and he would still be faithful. But he talks about this. I mean, this is a difficult thing to share the gospel, to tell somebody that, that they're condemned, that they're a sinner, and that they're, they're on their way to hell if they don't repent in Jesus Christ. I mean, it's good news, but you have to understand that it's only good news because the bad news is so bad. And so we have to be willing to share the bad news. The real bad news in your theology is that God hates you the way you are, the way he made you. He wants you to change yourself, to be the way he wants you to be, instead of the way he made you. Why is this, Dale? Was God incapable of making people the way he wanted them to be? Is God unwilling to make the effort to make people the way he wants them to be? Your theology says that people are incapable of making this change unless God predestined them to be called. And once God calls, that call is irresistible. So what difference does it make if anyone shares the gospel, as not sharing the gospel isn't what causes a person to fail to understand the bad and good news? It's God's work of changing the heart of the spiritually dead. This theology is so illogical. It claims that God is responsible for everything, but then blames people for God's failures. But the fear of rejection part makes sense. Fewer and fewer people are buying these fairy tales that you are peddling. Most of us recognize it as the bullshit that it is. It's not that no one will share this information. It's that we've all heard it and we aren't buying it. Number two is that we're afraid that we are not theologically equipped uh, to prepare and present an eloquently, uh, an eloquent presentation of the gospel. I'll grant that. Most believers don't read all of their Bibles. When they do, they tend to become atheists. Not always. But in general, atheists know the Bible better than most Christians do. It would certainly be difficult to convince someone that doesn't believe in the Bible that the Bible is true when you don't even know what it says. The third reason 
is that people are afraid of the apologetic questions that come as a result of a gospel proclamation moment, right? So they're afraid of, you know, moral relativism and the Big Bang Theory and what about the dinosaurs or whatever, right? They're, they're just mm-hmm. afraid of those discussions coming at them and they're not prepared to give answers for it. Of course they aren't. Apologists have repeatedly proven that they have no answers. The best of them simply conclude that God must have had reasons we can't understand for what he does because even they see that the world makes no sense under their theology. And so those three reasons, right? You got rejection, you got fear of of, uh, not being equipped, and you have uh, the apologetic questions. You layer those on top of each other and you go, wow, it's a pretty compelling reason to not preach the gospel. Yep, the fact that there's no truth there. There are no answers there. And the person that you want to preach this probably knows it better than you do. Is a pretty good reason to not preach it. Maybe do something else more productive with your time and reserve talking about your fairy tales to your own group on Sunday mornings. At this point, I listened ahead to see if they ever actually get to the book. It finally comes about 60% of the way through the video. But I'd be remiss if if we didn't spend maybe the last half of our time together talking about a new resource that you've put out, which is going to be aces for my audience. And it's a book called The Manliness of Christ, How the Masculinity of Jesus Eradicates Effeminate Christianity. Now, I, my understanding is that this was kind of like a, a resource that you put out on ReLearn. I'm assuming you got a lot of great feedback because of the importance of this, because here at Undaunted Life, we equip men to push back darkness. We are a men's ministry equipping men to you know, cultivate spiritual, mental, and physical resilience on a daily basis. Like, that's why we're here. That's why we're doing it. But it's the, the pussification of Christ. Yep, you heard him correctly. One of the biggest problems of the church today is the pussification of Christ. I'm surprised that that term isn't considered blasphemy. I'm also wondering why two men who are so staunchly anti-gay hate women so much. I know they claim to love women, but men who love women don't refer to women's genitalia in derogatory terms. It's the, the pussification of Christ that keeps a lot of men out of the church. So men don't go to church because they think God is too feminine? I thought God was supposed to be genderless. What I hear you saying is, if it doesn't have a prominent penis, I won't worship it. And then you can give us a little bit of context on that and why you decided to write this. So here's the quote. My hypothesis is this. Due to the feminization of Jesus, the cultural hatred of masculinity, and the lack of faithful exposition in the pulpit, we have been conditioned to not recognize the potent manliness and courageousness of Christ. Go. Amen. Yeah, so we have uh, an effeminate church because we have... Um, built up a caricature of an effeminate Jesus. And so the culture has, again, basically is dealing with the sin of idolatry, right? Idolatry is creating a God that we want in our own desires. I'll grant him that. God is whatever anyone wants God to be. You know why that is, Dale? Because God isn't real. A real person has real characteristics. This is something that I brought up in my conversation with Dr. Mullins. If there really is a God, then this God's characteristics would have to be a matter of fact, not whatever the person thinking about the God thinks them to be. Few people agree on who or what God is because either there is no real God or the real God has no desire to reveal himself to humans and doesn't care if humans speculate about who or what he, she, they, it might be. And so it's not just laying down and bowing down before a shrine. It's also idolatry is also creating a version of God that's not accurate to the scriptures. And so that's what culture has done. We've created a Roman Catholic version of Jesus where he's wearing blush and he's got his eyebrows tweezed. And that's how we we think of Jesus. That's quite the accusation there, Dale. I wonder if he's referring to this image. This one is from an article that says that Jesus could not have been white, as most depictions show him to be. Or maybe this one. But neither of these is from a Catholic site nor are the images used by churches new. They've been around for centuries. So why does Dale think that this is a new thing or that it's a Catholic thing when these are just artistic impressions, not the teachings of any church? We have all of our books and it's the soft and gentle. There's a chapter that I added from the article that I talk about the the most recent book by Dane Ortland, uh, who wrote a book called Gentle and Lowly. And this is like, this is like a, a blockbuster book in the sense of, I mean, thousands upon thousands upon thousands, tens of thousands of copies sold. Jealous, Dale? Your book is in the top 
half million, and it doesn't appear to be on any list of any subcategory. It's actually accurate to the scriptures on most. I, I would agree with it. The problem is it's a one-sided Jesus. Right. And, and that's the dilemma. And so I go, what is the other side of Jesus that the church has just conveniently avoided in this feministic era? Well, well Dale, like to, to that point with the feministic stuff, and don't, don't lose your train of thought. Like that was why we even started what we're doing here. That's why I have a lion over my shoulder, because I'm not saying, you know, seek the lamb of God to the detriment of understanding the, or seek the lion of Judah, uh, you know, you know, to the detriment of the understanding the lamb of God. But that's what most people hear me say. And it's like, no, you have an, you have an incomplete view of who Jesus is. If you see him only as a grace giver and not a truth giver, like, uh, like if you don't see his justice, if you don't see his ferocity, you see what like, so that's the thing that's absolutely astonishing to me, but keep going. Yeah. And if you, if you notice that I'm looking down, it's because I'm looking at the book right now, um, yeah, right. trying to get some different uh, notes out of this thing, but yeah, the, the manliness of Christ. I mean, there is a, uh, I'm actually, so the way, the reason I wrote this paper first, uh, it, it was a paper. So this is a paper that was turned into a book. Guess that's why it's only 72 pages. The fact that the Bible is silent on Jesus' alleged manliness would be another reason that this book is so short. I was finishing my last Christology class for like the very end of my seminary work uh, for actually Professor and Dr. Owen Strand. Some of you guys might follow him on social media. And so he was my professor for this. And you know, when you've been in seminary for as long as I have towards the end. Been in seminary for as long as I have. You said that you were there for one year, Dale. I went to seminary. I went to uh, Western Seminary for a year. Then I went over to the Master Seminary with John MacArthur. That isn't very long. People who stay long enough to get a degree stay a lot longer. Now, to be fair, he did say he's also taken classes with MacArthur Seminary. He doesn't specify how many classes or for how long. This seminary is accredited, but meets inside MacArthur's church. And again, it is only by men and for men. But Dale doesn't claim to have completed any seminary program. He also claims no theological degree. Guess he just spends a lot of time there, but is never able to finish. Possibly a reflection of his sex life as well? And you basically just kind of have some free reign to just, you know, write what you want to write, and, and you're really communicating with your professor. And so I wrote this, and he's like, man, this is, this is a really good piece. I like this idea. And I, I wasn't going to publish it. I put it up as an article on the website. And then uh, I got so much feedback from that. Uh, people were saying, hey, I'd, if you turn this into a book, I'd use it as men's ministry. And I said, all right, well, I'll just add a, add a little bit to it. Um, and, and I turned it into a book. Then I put it out on social media and I couldn't believe it. I mean, this is a small book. It's, it's, it could fit in your hand. You could read it in an hour. It's about 80 pages long. It's a punchy little book, which again, I, I wrote for men because guys don't have a lot of time. Right. We women have nothing to do, but men are busy. Here's your next 350 page book. Like that is not the thing that you want to hear. Uh, when you're a father and you got so many different things going on. And so, um, but this book, I mean, it, it's been bonkers in terms of the way it's been selling. Which gets it into the top half million category. Uh, so many women have bought it for their husbands on Father's Day. Uh, I'm, I'm so excited about that. But we're talking thousands of copies. Thousands of copies. Big whopping bestseller there, Dale. I'm actually going to write another chapter and add it to the next edition. Um, and I, I, what the things I talk about is just the, the resolve of Christ, the fearlessness of Christ, the, the boldness of Christ, uh, the intensity of Christ, um, just the rawness of Christ. And one, the new chapter that I'm going to put in is the, just the intense language. Uh, you brood of vipers. He calls men liars to their face. Mm. You whitewash tombs. This is, this is like most Christians today are just cowards. They're just afraid to use these language against evil. What does this have to do with manliness? Do you think women lack these qualities? If so, make a case for that. Instead, you claim that Jesus was a manly man. Honey, I'm going ice fishing. I'm going to do some manly stuff in the outdoors. But the traits that you claim that make him manly aren't even masculine traits. Manly, yes, but I like it too. But Jesus was just ruthless uh, in the way that he spoke to those who were standing op opposed to him. So ruthlessness is a manly trait? I won't disagree with you there in one respect. Many of the most ruthless people ever to live have been men, but not all of them. What I find puzzling is you wanting to compare Jesus to these. This is the image you want people to have of your God, 
a ruthless, bloodthirsty, inhumane, spiteful person devoid of love? I mean, he is, but I don't think you would want to admit that, nor do I think it speaks well of men if you claim that these are masculine traits. And so there, there's some, something to be learned there. The biggest thing about the hallmark piece of the book was really, uh, I, I was reading a book called The Cross of Christ by John Stott. Right. Man, this book is just absolutely essential Christian reading, but you really learn about the resolve of Christ. Christ went to the cross knowing he was about to be just physically demolished. And one would rightfully ask why a loving God would want to make that plan for their child. Since the Father and the Son are also the same person, I would guess that Jesus himself helped devise this alleged plan. Why would anyone who had the ability to make another plan make this one? Makes you wonder about Jesus' alleged words at Gethsemane. Father, if it is possible, let this cup pass from me. Aren't all things supposed to be possible with God? It sounds like Jesus changed his mind about going through with the plan. Believers will be quick to point out that his next words were allegedly, but not my will, but thine be done. They see this as the submission of Jesus to the Father, but they miss the cruelty of the Father imposing his will on the Son to the Son's detriment, when the suffering was completely unnecessary. Unnecessary as God could have simply decided to forgive humanity for being human the way he made them, instead of demanding a blood sacrifice in order to do it. Or, if that was too much, just don't make them human. Make something else that does please you instead of these creatures that you despise so much. Jesus is out ahead of us, and he knows what's happening. He's leading the way. He's not, he's not um, holding back. He's not being fearful. He's not timid. He's out in front. And, and this is, again, it kind of reminds me of those men of World War II when you see, you know, uh, they're walking out in front to the battle mm -hmm. and they just go, if I die, I die, but this is the work that needs to be done. I'm going. That, that kind of raw masculinity you see in Christ. First, this is an insult to all women in the armed forces. Yes, in World War II, the American women that served in the armed forces did not serve in combat positions. But that wasn't because combat is a masculine thing. It was because until 2013, American women were banned from combat positions. When you ban women from an activity, that doesn't make the activity masculine. It only appears masculine because you won't allow the women to participate. Every place that women have been barred from, like voting, certain jobs, hell, even riding on trains, have not been masculine places. They're just places that men kept women out. Take the trains issue. When locomotives were first invented, some nut reasoned that women's bodies weren't designed to move at over 50 miles an hour, and that if they did, their uteruses might fly out of their bodies. Nevertheless, women stuck up for their right to mobility. In 1909, 22-year-old Alice Ramsey managed to drive cross-country in a respectable 59 days, and having kept herself, her car, and her three female friends intact along the way. Helped to prove that women could be trusted behind the wheel. Women didn't have the right to vote until 1920. Did that make voting a masculine activity? Of course not. Women weren't allowed to serve on juries until 1879. Did that make jury duty a masculine activity? Women weren't allowed to get credit cards until 1974, when I was 13. Until then, there was no law against it, but when women applied for cards, they were consistently told that they weren't credit worthy unless their husbands agreed to sign for them. This continues to be an issue for older women who have never established a credit history in their own name. If a woman's husband dies and all her credit history is in her dead husband's name, she has no credit history and can be denied credit on his death. So to say that this is a masculine activity because men have managed to exclude women from this activity is circular reasoning. As soon as the bars are removed from the cages that men want to keep women in, they find women who excel at the very things that men thought women incapable of doing. The pastorate is no exception. Dale would have you believe that women can't be pastors because God said so. 
But these exclusions are based on verses in Titus and 1 Timothy, the pastoral letters that most scholars now agree are forgeries attributed to Paul, according to Raymond Collins, a Catholic priest. By the end of the 20th century, New Testament scholarship was virtually unanimous in affirming that the pastoral epistles were written sometime after Paul's death. Why would an omniscient God need to rely on a forgery to convey his rules for the pastorate? What's more, the fact that these letters purport to be written by Paul makes them outright lies. Since we can reasonably be certain that the author lied about who was writing the book, why then trust that what the author wrote in the book was inspired by God? That I'm glad you brought up uh, David and Goliath, because another problem, here we are defining all the problems of the modern Western church, another problem that we see is that we've been convinced that we're David in that story. <laughs> that when you, you know what I mean? Like, so I remember when Matt, uh, Matt Chandler pointed this out, he was invited to go speak at uh, Elevation Church, Stephen Furtick's church years ago. And he basically went in there and burned it down and walked away where he basically, he screamed at these people and said, you're not David. I'll agree with you on that one. The church, at least in the U.S., is not persecuted. They are not the underdog. I'm sure with a Democratic president and Senate, some believers see themselves that way. But newsflash, Democrats aren't necessarily unbelievers. In fact, most Democrats in the government are your fellow believers. They just disagree with you on politics. But for the most part, they agree with you on theology. Although, to be fair, these two guys are Calvinists, so though most Democrats in government are some flavor of Christian, few, if any, are Calvinists. Calvinists are to the left of the NIFB and hate preachers, but a bit to the right of Genghis Khan. Like, you're not the point. God is not about you. God is about his glory. And I remember that being like a crazy turning point for me. It should be. Since the major appeal of the church is an emotional appeal that God loves you and has a wonderful plan for your life, this theology says that God loves no one but himself. He, in his mercy, decides to spare a few for his own glory, not because he loves you or that you matter, but because he loves himself and his own glory. So why, again, are we supposed to like this God? Thinking like, I even got chills right now just thinking about that moment. Why? Chills of fear that God cares nothing about you? You mean nothing to the object of your worship? It should give you chills, but not in the way that you mean. More like in the manner in keeping with your face as frozen in this frame. But the part of the thing is, is, you lose the personality of Christ. I'm glad you're adding this chapter. You lose his intensity when you read the Bible deadpan. Deadpan is my favorite form of humor. I'm watching you, Wazowski. Always watching. Remember, do not forget how you provoked the Lord your God to anger in the wilderness. From the day that you left the land of Egypt until you arrived at this place, you have been rebellious against the Lord. Maybe that's his problem. Read it like that, and it's actually funny. Thing you said, guys. I read this on a short flight this week. I mean, it's it's you know widely typeset, so you can buzz through this thing pretty quickly. So so don't get you know bogged down in the weeds about oh I got to read a book and I don't have time. Because men have more problems with reading. Is that a difficult thing for you unless it's short? explains why you believe this mind-numbingly emptiness that is your theology. But let me read this quote to you. The gender role distortion and infatuation with egalitarianism have contributed to great confusion in the church of what it means to be a biblical man or woman. It has left women fighting for leadership and left men without direction in their role in marriage, church, and family. But more than that, it has left children without visible models of biblical masculinity and femininity. In fact, I strongly believe this has been the enemy's central strategy for this generation. He has influenced the church to such a place of feminine emotion that when the time comes for masculine boldness, fearlessness, sacrifice and resolve, the church and culture will be grossly unprepared. The truth is church history is saturated with Christians being tortured, dismembered, eaten, shot, hung, racked, boxed, buried, and burned for Christ. The timidity of the current church, which submits to government overreach and complies with laws enforcing unbiblical support of sexual sin, will be costly. First, where did the government ever force you into sexual sin when complying with the law? 
Complying with laws that support what you see as sexual sin, like allowing gay marriage, has no effect on you or your church, provided you don't engage in the permitted activity. The problem here is that you want your position, your theology, to hold a position of privilege. You want the right to marry the person of your choice for yourself, but you want to deny that right to anyone who disagrees with you about the definition of marriage. You want exclusivity for your group's rules and norms, not inclusivity for different viewpoints. And that's fine inside the walls of your church. You can have your exclusive penis bearers only club. The problem comes when you want to impose your theology on those of us who don't agree with your theology, which isn't just unbelievers and people of different faiths. Even within the Christian community, other Christians disagree with you. So what makes your theology so special that it should be the law for everyone and not just those who actually buy into your version of the fairy tale? This is the hinge point here. The time is coming soon when the need for masculine Christian men will be intense, but their availability will be short. Cool. I'm fine with that. The reason the availability is short is too many people are fact-checking your claims and finding them to be nonsense. That few believe anymore shouldn't be a reason to dig in your heels, but should give you pause to consider if what you believe really is true. If it isn't true, is there any reason for you to believe it? You didn't hang on to Santa or the Tooth Fairy when you discovered they aren't true. It's time to let this myth go, too. Satan's ultimate plan in the world is that men will be boys. I mean, not his ultimate plan. His ultimate plan is to make sure people go to hell. Where did you get this from? Nowhere in the Bible does it say anything about Satan wanting people to go to hell. The closest it comes is saying that Satan goes about as a roaring lion wanting to devour people. But devour doesn't necessarily mean sending to hell. According to the Bible, the only one that has the power and ability to send anyone to hell is your God. Maybe, and I'd seriously like you to consider this possibility, though I know with the God glasses you wear, it won't be possible for you. Consider the possibility that Satan doesn't want you to believe this because God only loves himself and doesn't have your best interests in mind. Now, consider the even more likely scenario that none of this is real. There is no Satan. There is no God. There are just these stories made up by people to get people to behave in a certain way and to bring them comfort when the troubles of the world become overwhelming. But uh, Satan's cultural plan is that men will be boys, that women will be men, and that children will be irrelevant. If the women are men, they can pick up the mantle and lead the church for you. Frankly, I think the women can do a much better job. For starters, we'll come up with a better God that actually does the things that it claims, and actually loves people and meets human needs. And there will be no hell. Wouldn't this be a better God? Okay, and so th this is what we're seeing right now is we're seeing a timidity that comes across men, keeping them to act like boys. Right. We're seeing a influence of uh, women as a result, because men are cowards, women become men. I think what you are really seeing is men owning up to the fact that women are people too, and allowing them a seat at the table. If your idea of men is that they are an exclusive club that get all the rights and privileges, then maybe your problem isn't that men have become boys, but rather these boys never grew up in the first place and never learned how to share. Dale, it's time for you to grow up and learn how to share. It's you that's stuck in boyhood, demanding your own way and failing to listen to other viewpoints. Not accepting others is a childish way of viewing the world. And, and that's just the reaction. Somebody has to be the man. You seem to equate being a decision maker with being a man. Again, this is your failure to consider that this isn't manhood, it's adulthood. You equate not being a decision maker with childhood and then want to force women into this position. How do you not see that what you are doing is infantilizing women? You are so cocksure that being in authority is a masculine thing that you see women having that same authority as infantilizing men. But what you fail to see is that denying women that right does in fact infantilize them. How about sharing the toys, Dale? Let the men and women both be the grown-ups. Why is that so hard? 
Well, Dale, we see this visually. Like, 10 years ago, there weren't a whole bunch of yoked up gym bro females, but in an era where we're elevating the dad bod as like, oh, this is fine and uh, this is actually preferable. Then we see at the same time, all these women that aren't just in shape, but they're jacked. And, and I know that that's, uh, I'm just painting with a broad brush here, but you can see it visually. Like we don't have to operate in the spiritual realm to see this. Then maybe you shouldn't make being jacked a value. Or better yet, just accept that not only does not everyone share your values, they shouldn't be forced to. That you think this is a new phenomena is just evidence of your lack of historical understanding and a glorified image of the past being more like you want it to be. Some of the Greek and Roman goddesses were jacked. Athena was the goddess of war. Artemis was the goddess of the hunt. This article is about jacked women of the 19th and 20th centuries. Granted, on average, men are more muscular than women, but there have always been and always will be some women who are better endowed in the way of musculature. Yeah, see, the reality is, is when you talk to sound-minded women, they really want biblical men. Sound-minded women, translation, women who think the way I want them to. Ladies, those of us who disagree with Dale and have no interest in biblical men, Dale would declare us to be of unsound minds. Even if they're not right. Christians, they want exactly. a man that is protecting, providing for them, caring for them, leading them. They, they want they Women don't really want the feminist agenda. They've been told that they want that. How many women did you actually talk to to arrive at this conclusion? Let me guess, your wife whose opinion was dictated to her by you, and maybe a few other women in your church, who also are told what opinions they are allowed to have by their husbands. Sure. Of a man. Now, the other side is that we need to know what biblical femininity is so that we can lead our wives to it. So we can smash our wives' faces in it and force them to accept what we want them to think. Heaven forbid that any woman should be allowed to think for herself. You don't just leave your wife to learn femininity on her own. You thought I was exaggerating? How is it that Dale can't see that what he is saying is, don't allow women to think for themselves. Don't allow women to learn anything you don't want them to learn. Control what they see and hear so you can control their thoughts. You actually want to lead her in the scriptures and let the scriptures teach her femininity. Right. You want women to accept that a bunch of men 3,000 years ago that thought women should be property were right because they claimed to speak for God. Now you too speak for God, so women had better accept that God wants them to stop thinking that they are people and accept that they are property, just like the ox and the ass. doesn't mean that women don't also have a role in teaching other women. Absolutely, they do, uh, and men teaching other men. But there is a role for a husband and a father to learn the territory to teach that to their family. Women can teach other women once the men get control of their thinking. They turn to another topic at this point, gender, which if I cover it, needs to be its own video. I've had as much Dale Partridge as I can stomach for one day. You would think that roasted partridge would be a small meal, but this one was more than I wanted. His heart is so black, the whole meal tasted burnt. I sure would hate to grow up in this Partridge family. I hope the kids find their way out of their dad's nonsense. If it were up to Dale, there would be no women's history. There would be no women in government, in science, on the Supreme Court, on trains, and so on. Fortunately, Partridge is a dying breed. Let him squawk all he wants, but let's empower women to escape the infantilizing theology so that they can grow to their potential as well. Live your life. The, the pussification of Christ, the, the pussification of Christ that...